God, what a sweet opportunity we have. Any time that we come and gather as your people, gather to, to sing, gather to, to pray, gather to hear your word. So Lord, as we continue to move through this time, we pray that you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart here be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. So this is week three of our series called Reset. And the purpose for this series is because we've been in a big reset. If you, if you really think about what has happened over the past 14, 15 months now, we have had to totally reset what we've done. Now, the good news is that, is that the message hasn't changed, that, that, that we still proclaim Christ and, and him crucified for each and every one of us. But we realize that there are times that we have to, to reorient ourselves and, and not wish for what has happened in the past, but, but be thankful for what has happened in the past so that it may guide us and lead us to where God is calling us to go in the future. About three weeks ago, when I started the series, I reached out to uh, four different church members, and, and I asked them, what have you learned over the past 14 months? Well, what is it that you have learned during this pandemic? And I've got these response. One said that we may tear our clothes and wail, woe is me, but God's love for us never changes. He continually demonstrates how much he cares by placing people in our midst to help carry us through. Another member wrote, I have learned that God is especially faithful during times of uncertainty. I have learned that God uses my church family to feed my spirit, and I will never take for granted the privilege and honor to worship with my church family in person. A third member wrote, The main thing that I have learned about my faith is to trust him in everything, specifically in the unknown world that we are living in. I have learned, I have leaned on my favorite scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11, often for the last 14 months. And if you're not familiar with that, that's for I know the plans that I have for you, plans of, for, not for destruction, but plans for our hope and for a future. I have been a registered nurse for 22 years, and never did I ever imagine I would live through, much less work through, a global pandemic. On top of a pandemic, we have all witnessed political ugliness and racial hatred at the national, state, and local level, including our brothers and sisters in Christ, as well as within families. This is big. I find myself praying more often than I ever have before and often being so overwhelmed that sometimes I don't really know what I'm praying for. But he does. He knows my heart. And I have to trust that he is our creator, he is our savior, and he has us all. And then the, the last person, uh, in what she wrote, she, she wrote, and, and I think this is something for us to really think about, being separated from God is worse than anything that this world can throw us. Just, just, just think about that for a second. Being separated from God is worse than anything, anything that this world can throw at us. Knowing that we have this relationship with God, knowing that, that he loves us and that he cares for us and that, that he is always there for us, gives us this assurance. And, and then, then she followed it up with the, this meme that she sent me that, that says this, faith is not about everything turning out okay. Faith is about being okay no matter how things turn out. 
How, how true is that? To, to have that assurance that, that faith is not about wanting everything to be okay, but knowing where we're held. And, and I love how, how God uses moments or, or, or social media at times that, to help highlight a point. And, and he did that for me this week. After I saw that, that, that meme, I was uh, scrolling through Facebook, and, and I saw this post from a TV show called uh, America's Got Talent. It's been on for a while. It has like Howie Mandel and, and Co- Simon Cowell on there right now. And, and, and the video starts out with, with this woman by the name of Jane Murkowski. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but she, she walks out on stage, and she says that she's, she's a singer. And she has a, a stage name that she goes by by the name of Nightbird. And she was going to sing an original song. And, and, and the, the judges just kind of sat there and went, okay, well, that, that's fine. And, and then they started to ask her her story. What do you do? Are you a singer? And she says, well, I, I really haven't done anything for, for the past couple of years. And they're like, why, why haven't you? I said, well, I've, I've been battling cancer. And she said that she recovered from cancer twice. And now she has cancer again. And I believe it was in her her spine, in her liver, and in her stomach, I think is what she said. And the doctors have only given me a 2% chance. And there she was on stage of America's Got Talent getting ready to sing. And I remember uh, they, they kept showing Simon Cowell, and, and, and he had that, that Simon look on his face every single time that she would talk. And I, I could see the Simon Cowell, oh, brother, whenever she said, oh, I've written a song, and I'm going to sing that song. I was like, okay, well, here comes one of these just songs that somebody wrote, and they think that they're wonderful, and we'll just move through this and, and move on. And she sang, and my friends, I tell you, it was absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. And one of the things that she said before, before she sang, they, they were asking her, how did she handle all of this? And then she said these words, you can't wait until life isn't hard anymore before you decide to be happy. You can't wait until life isn't hard anymore before you decide to be happy. And and, and if I tell you, go take a look at this. If you haven't seen it, go take a look at it. It'll bring tears to your eyes. It's just so, so beautiful. But but there's something even more beautiful, is that she wasn't just a a good singer that that had a song that that touched people's hearts. Is that she had the opportunity to express her faith right there on the stage, because Jane is a strong believer in Jesus Christ, even with all that she's gone through. Religious news services picked up her story, and they interviewed her, and she gave them this quote. I believe that God can heal in one instant. I also believe that no good thing does he withhold. So there was something God was growing in the field that is me. And if God had pulled up all of this hardship too soon, it would have also pulled up all these miracles he did in my spirit. So this was written or spoken from a woman who has a 2% chance of surviving the cancer she has. And she knows that that all of the hardships that she has, it was just God taking time to produce miracles in her life. Miracles that, that are going to touch people all around the world. I think the same thing could be said about our faith. And I think the same thing could be said about what we have gone through over the past 15 months is that all of the things that we have been going through, God has been growing something inside of us that I think we want to to discard because we want to get rid of it. But the fact of the matter is that we must hold on to those things and, and, and learn and live through those things so that the miracles 
that God has planned for each and every one of us can grow in our spirit so that we can then share that miracles with others around us. There's one thing I know in my, in my 49 years of living, as much as I hate to admit it, and I think you all know this too, is that life will always have difficulty. But there's always going to be something that, that, that is going to, to cause some difficulty or pain in your life. I think there's somebody said that there are two people in this world, those who are going through difficult times and, and those that will be going through difficult times. But it shouldn't surprise us as followers of Jesus Christ because he told us about this. In John chapter 16, verse 33, he reminds us that in the world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. See, that's why as, as, a, as a church, we focus on our mission and, and we focus on our vision. And that's why we've been talking about this over the past few weeks and we'll, we'll continue over the next few weeks just to remind us how important the mission of our church is and the vision of our church is even when things are, are hard, even when things are difficult, that we have a, a, a guide to help see us through, that we have uh, someone who is guiding and leading us and that our task is to continue to grow as his disciples. So if you'll join me uh, as a reminder, would you please join me in stating our, our mission and vision together. The mission of our church is making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Now remember that the transformation of the world is, is a byproduct. And that, that, that's not the mission. The mission is making disciples. And then once we, as disciples, are, are gathered together, we then go out to transform the world. And we do that transformation through the vision that we have as a church, which we begin reminding you is to be gods. I think it's the next slide, yeah. Be gods. You belong here. Worshiping together, serving with heart, and growing in faith. We're going to be taking a look at this, and we've been looking at the, the means of grace, or the five instituted means of grace, those, those five ways that we see in Scripture that God gives us ways that we can, can connect with the love and grace that Jesus has for us, that, that opens our hearts to receive what God so freely gives to each and every one of us. And today we are going to talk about prayer. So our scripture for this morning is from James chapter 5 verses 13 through 16. If you have your Bibles, please follow along there. If not, we'll have the words up on the screen. Hear the word of the Lord. James writes, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is any among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will, will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Through confession, your sin, therefore confess your sin to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So prayer. Prayer is what we do as a church, isn't it? We, we pray a lot, and thank goodness we do. I mean, we, we pray here in the worship service. If you're a part of, of any meeting that happens in this church, there is prayer that happens within the meeting. If you are a part of a small group, there is prayer that happens at the small group. Even when we have the opportunity to go out and serve, prayer is, is, is a part of that because it's foundational to who we are. 
We see prayer happen all the way throughout scriptures, for from, from Genesis all the way through Revelation. Sometimes the prayer is, is so easy to see, like the written prayers that we see in the Psalms. Sometimes the prayers are, 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 are not hidden, but, but they're kind of hard to grasp when you see Adam and Eve walking in the coolness of the shade with God. Those, those acts of prayers are ways that, that we as the followers of Jesus Christ can continue to be in relationship with him. And, and the one thing that we have to realize is that prayer can be as simple or as, as involved as we want to make it. Prayer can be something that we do maybe five seconds just to acknowledge God or lift up those cards that we uh, passed out a few weeks ago that said, Jesus, I belong to you. Just looking at that card or saying that phrase, that's a prayer. It's an acknowledgement of who God is and who we are and who we belong to. Prayer can be as involved as as groaning of intercessions when times get tough. Whether you're you're, you're sitting at a a, a stoplight for a few minutes and and you you say a quick prayer while you're sitting there because something has come to your mind, or or if you come before the altar and and you, you, you kneel down and you bury your head into the floor and you are just crying out for God to move in your life. Prayer is, is, is so vital to each and every one of us because it gives us the opportunity to connect. I've been reading a book on the uh, means of grace written by uh, Elaine Heath, who is a uh, professor. A- and she was writing about an experience with a mentor of hers that was talking about the steps that you do with a, a new believer, what is it that you should do with them? A, and this mentor told Elaine Heath that the most important thing is that you should teach a new believer how to pray before you teach them theology. A, and that really threw Elaine off and said, why, why do we want to do that? Why do we want to focus on prayer before we, we actually teach them exactly what the theology is all about. And her mentor told her, it teaches them to gaze into the face of Jesus who gazes back with infinite love. It teaches them to gaze upon Jesus who who gazes back with infinite love. But before any type of theology needs to be, be taught or caught, People need to know that there is a God who loves and cares for them in such a way that is more than than just a a simple relationship. It is an infinite love, a love that that Jesus looking at us and knowing that that, that we are one of his, that, that we belong to Jesus. Now, I know it's, it's easy for us to think that prayer is something that we do in order to get something from God. You may have heard of the, uh, the vending mach- machine Jesus, where, where, where you go in front of a vending machine and you, and you have all of these things that you want. And, and, and what prayer is, is that you, you enter the right amount of money into the vending machine and press the right buttons, and, and what you come out is, is, is what you get and is what you really want. But that's not what prayer is. Prayer is all about a relationship. It's about stopping and understanding that that I am taking time away from from all those other things that are calling and driving my attention just to be with God. Just allow Him to pour His love and His mercy and grace on us. See, See, that's the purpose of prayer purpose of prayer is all about God, and it's not about us as much as we would like for that prayer to be. It's, it's all about us stopping and listening and hearing from God, and, and we do that in, in all of our vision. Every, every part of our vision involves stopping and allowing prayer to guide us. 
First, worshiping together. How, how do we, we act in prayer? Well, first of all, prayer is a communal thing. Prayer reminds us that this thing called faith in Christ isn't a solitary thing. We don't grow in our faith by ourselves. Now, I may get some pushback on that, where you say, well, I, I do, do my Bible study, I, I read like the upper room or the seabed daily text, and I, and I grow my faith that way. Yeah, but how you actually react to that, how actually you, you, you join together in prayer. If you notice, the great prayer that we pray every Sunday doesn't start out, my Father, what does it start out with? Our Father, who art in heaven. We, we are collectively saying together that we are in this side by side with one another. And if we fail to do that, then we, we miss the whole point of what it is that, that God has called us to do as his people. If you notice, when I pray, hopefully uh, I, I do a much better job of this. I think I do. But whenever I pray, you never hear me say, oh, God, I am so unless I'm trying to correct something that I've done while I'm doing the, the pastoral prayer. But I'm always saying, we, oh Lord, we, your people, are coming to you to be filled by you, to, to, to be lifted up by you so that we can be strengthened side by side with one another. You know, Jesus did something very interesting in the temple uh, shortly before he uh, was handed over to Pontius Pilate that, that, that week before uh, the, the, the Passion. He, he went into the temple and he saw those uh, people selling animals and changing money into the temple. And he went and he, he turned over all of the tables. And, and somebody asked him, well, what's going on here? And then in Matthew 21, he quotes Isaiah 56. And he reminds the people that my house shall be called a house of prayer. He's not saying that my house is a house of, of singing. He's not saying my house is a house of, of listening to a sermon. No, my house is a house of of prayer. And, and as your pastor, my, my biggest honor and, and my biggest privilege as your pastor is, isn't what I'm doing up here right now. My biggest honor and privilege isn't going out and representing Royce City First United Methodist Church at, at Rotary or, or any meetings or, or anything like that. My biggest honor as your pastor is, is to pray for you, which I do a lot. Now, I may not pray for you individually every day, but, but I pray for our church all the time. And uh, if you notice, over the past few weeks, we've started to, to end our services with prayer. If, you, if you're ready to go, you can go. But if you need prayer, I will always be right over here, able and willing and ready to pray for you, to allow the pouring of the Holy Spirit to come on you so that you can experience God's love and grace in your life. Because that is what we are about is lifting each other up in prayer, especially in difficult times like this. You know, over the past 15 months, I prayed for those who have been in worship. I prayed for those who are, are worshiping online. I prayed for those who, who haven't come back yet because I know God is working in their lives in a way that, that, that maybe we can't even see or even understand, but God's love and grace is pouring out his love and mercy on you. And as your pastor, I want to be praying for you. So what about serving with heart? How, how is prayer a part of serving with heart? Well, it, it's participation. Dallas Willard says that prayer is collaboration with God. Any time that I do any kind of mission work, I, I pray that God opens my heart and mind to see those that we are in mission with. Now, notice I didn't say in mission to, because that, that gives us this idea that because I'm going on mission, that I'm, missioning, I'm a missionary to someone. It's so that I'm here and they're there. But the fact of the matter is, all, every time, 
and, and I, I can say this with, with true accuracy, every time that I've done a mission trip, I have been ministered to more than I have probably ministered to somebody else. One year uh, during a youth mission trip, we went to uh, Appalachia, I think it was Kentucky, if I remember right, and we were working on a gentleman's house. Uh, the roof needed uh, a bunch of repair work. It was really, really cool work. But it was on this like cul-de-sac uh, out in this farmland where there were like four or five homes that were kind of gathered around. And the very first day after we prayed, I looked up at the house next to us, and there was a guy, I think I called him Bob. Uh, he, he was sitting uh, there on his porch. And I noticed him. And I'm like, okay. Well, the next day that we came out there on Tuesday, I noticed that, that Bob kind of took his chair and he moved it out into it. Uh, into the yard. I think there was a tree there, so he put his his uh, chair underneath the tree so he could kind of get a little closer and see what was going on. I was like, all righty. And, and then I noticed the next day that, that, that Bob really was trying to connect with somebody that was on the work crew. So I, so I just said, pray, God, if there's something I need to do, please let me go and, and, and do that with this, this gentleman. And, and I went over and I started to talk to Bob, and, and we shared a little bit about his life. He was an ex-military and, and retired, and he uh, moved back home. I think he had the family land, and, and, and we talked quite a bit. And, and I admit that the details of our conversation have, have left me, but the feeling that I have, I still remember is that he needed somebody to talk to him. And, and our mission team was there at that particular time so that he could share with me what was going on with his life. And I'll admit that I, I still pray for Bob. You know, it, it, he'll, he'll, he'll pop up into my mind every once in a while, and I'll, I'll lift up a prayer. Sorry, I don't have like a, a cool, this is how the story ended. But, you know, honestly... Most of the times that we pray, we don't, we don't, we, most of the times that we pray for somebody that we've worked for or have done something, we don't have that end of the story message. Because I don't think God wants us to have that end of the story message. Because then we start thinking, what is it that I'm able to get from that interaction instead of how is God blessing me and how is God blessing, continuing to bless Bob? or John, or Jose, or whoever you have prayed for? How is God continuing to bless their lives so that they see Christ's love in them? See, it's all a part of growing in our faith. When we pray about God serving, and we pray about God in worship, when we see that God is able to allow us to grow through our prayers. And I think the most important thing that we grow through is that it releases our desire to worship the false trinity of me, myself, and I and fully worship and surrender to the Father and the Son and to the Holy Spirit. To, to allow the triune God to guide us and lead us instead of what it is that I need at the moment, what it is that, that, that I need to, to make myself feel whole. Well, the fact of the matter is, all we need is to allow God to make us whole. Elaine Heath uh, continued, and she talks about how prayer helps develop the ability to tell the difference between doctrine that honors Jesus and doctrine that leads to legalism, quarrels and strife. If our prayers are, are prayers that calls for us to, to, to put down someone else or, or to exclude someone else, then we are not doing prayer correctly. The prayers that we lift up to help us grow should allow us to let, uh, lift up prayers to help people know who Jesus is. And have that doctrine that of Jesus that, that helps them to experience the love and grace of our Savior. Because finally, what prayer does, it helps us realize, is that God's the one in control and we're not. Now, I'm not saying that God is a puppet master kind of leading and guiding us in every single step that we make. 
but that God gives us ways to see how we can move forward as his people. To fully allow ourselves to, to, to see him in the midst of every situation, just like Jane Nightbird saw as she sang her song and as she ex shared her experience that even through the darkest and difficult times, God is there. Let us pray. Oh Lord, right now I know that we have people in our church who are suffering, who are looking for direction and who are looking for ways to, to see you break through in their lives. So God, I ask that you just open their hearts and minds to you. Lord, when they pray to you this week, whisper them that assurance that you are madly in love with them and that you know that the pain that they have gone through, the difficulties that they have seen, you, you hold in your arms and your heart breaks with them. Lord, as we continue our prayer, guide us and lead us to be faithful disciples of yours, to allow the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to, to guide us and lead us so that we may share your love with others. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.